Hello, it's a pleasure once again coming into your homes this evening. This is your instructor, Steven Esnajiman, coming to take you through business management to prepare you for your WASI 2020. It's going to be fun, it's going to be interesting because today we are going to look at a very, very important topic for business management. And that is going to be case study. No, you know that it carries about 25 good marks. So you can't afford to miss this wonderful opportunity that has presented itself to you this evening right in your home, in your comfort of your home. Stay behind, relax, sit in your sofas, get your notepad, get your pen, and put the important points that are going to help you in that regard. Call your friends, let them come on board, sit by the television set, as we enjoy the show together. It's going to be business management and we are going to study case study. Stand by, we'll be right back. Hello, lovely students. I am Samo Sechi Ado, popularly known as Boga San, the Geography Master for Form 1, Form 2, and Form 3. As a Geography student, you'll be taught Physical Geography, Human and Regional Geography, and Practical Geography, which involves the application of skills of map reading, map interpretation, data collection, and data analysis. Cut me on, Joy Le where you would acquire the knowledge and the understanding of your community, your nation, and the world at large. See you there. Welcome back to the show. So we start our discussions. Like I indicated early on, we are going to look at case study. And let me once again reiterate the fact that it carries 25 good marks. So if you want to make your A that we all expect you to make, then it depends to a large extent on case study. Because when you get 21, 22, 23, then you are gone. Your A is assured. So now, when you talk about case study, basically, you are going to be presented with a case, right? It's like a passage, if I should liken it to what happens in English language. And it's normally a real life problem that exists in a particular business, right? And you are expected to read the case and understand it to be able to answer questions on that. It's basically aimed at using your principles, the concepts you have learned from Form 1 to Form 3, to be able to solve that problem that exists in the business establishment. So basically that's what we are going to do. So you don't concentrate on a particular topic, it runs through all the topics you have learned, starting from Form 1 to Form 3. So sit back, relax, and let's go through. So let's look at what case study briefly is. Now, so we look at the meaning of case study and we say that case study is the application of management theories to solve a real life problem in an organization, right? So it could be a sole proprietorship, it could be a company, and there's a problem. It could be on motivation, it could be on the type of leadership and what have you, and uh, the problem has to be solved. If the organization is supposed to exist to make profit, and we learned in Form 1 that businesses exist primarily to make profit. So if indeed you want to make your profit, there are problems, in the organization have to be dealt with. They have to be solved to be able to make your profit, all right? So briefly, that's what we're gonna say about what case study is. Now, let's look at the nature of case study in the business management you know, subject. Now, the WASI case study question is compulsory and candidates are expected to answer this question for 25 marks. I think I've already said that, so 25 good marks. You can imagine how important it is to you especially as a candidate, right? Good. 
Now, we continue by saying that series of organizational problems are presented to candidates in a particular context. Let me emphasize this, right? Context. Mm? Because every word that you alter in language is put in a particular context, right? So I will, I will be emphasizing the point that as far as case study is concerned, you don't have to import fact, right? Importation, you don't import fact. Stay to the fact given to you, right? For instance, if in a particular case concerning the country Ghana, it is presented that, let's say, a Kuyadonko is a president of Ghana, you don't go and claim to, to, to correct that because you see that as a problem, an error, so you want to correct it by saying that, no, it's not Kuyadonko, but Rene Kufuado. No, you would rather be making a mistake. So stay to the fact as presented to you. So in that case, if you are asked who is the president of Ghana, you just have to give them that a Kuyadonko is the president of Ghana, so her excellency. So it's that simple. So the context, very, very important. Now, Case study questions cover a wide range of issues, principles, concepts, topics, etc. It therefore requires that candidates read and understand the concepts in a subject if they are to do well. Right? So you don't you know, see case study as a particular topic and you study it. That only equips you with the technicalities, right? with the adequate knowledge scale to be able to present your answers to warrant the highest marks that you deserve or you want to get your A, all right? What it simply means is that you have to look at all the topics. But of course, some could be emphasized more than others. For example, you can, take, you can talk about you know, forms of business organizations, sole proprietorship, partnership, corporate societies, companies, and what have you. Theories of motivation, right? You come to marketing because you can't do business without marketing. You have to produce, you have to make the good available to the consumers as much as possible so they can buy, right? So, you know, marketing, human resource management, and all of these concepts, you have to look at them. Once you understand all of these concepts, of course, let me not leave out sources of business finance, also very important. Though quite simple, but it's also very important because you do business and you need finances, right? So where do you get your long-term, medium-term, and sh you know, short-term finances? That is also very important. So it behoves you, the student, to be able to read around all of these topics, right? So that you are equipped with the, the, the necessary knowledge, concepts, to be able to answer your questions and get your maximum marks. Good. So let's move on. Let's look at how we are supposed to present our case study questions. So how to answer case study questions. The first one, I am telling you to read through the case, all right? So the case, it may be around 250 words, about four or five you know, paragraphs. So first, read through, all right? You read through the whole case from the first sentence to the last sentence. That is the first paragraph to the last paragraph. I hope that is very clear to you. Good. You go ahead and read through all the questions. Normally, you'll be asked to answer about four or five questions for the 25 marks. So after going through the first reading, what I call skimming, I mean, it's like reading newspapers, OK? You are looking for some salient point. So you don't actually take your time to read through everything for meaning. You just, you, you just skim. You, you, you just run through. After that, you read through all your questions, the four, five, or six questions, as the case may be, right? So by now, you would know that you have some idea as to what you would be expected to do, or the kind of questions you were expected to answer. You don't end there, you do a second reading, right? So you read, after reading through the questions, you have to go back to the case and read from the first sentence to the last sentence. That is the first paragraph to the last paragraph. So after doing the second reading, you realize that you begin to appreciate what you are expected to do. Okay? Good. Now, it doesn't end there because you may not get your concept right because you need to understand the case to be able to answer the questions. If you don't understand, you don't have you know, a proper appreciation, understanding of the case, then I'm sorry, you will not be able to answer it properly. Right? So you go ahead and do a third reading. Okay, you do a third reading. Now, 
Sometimes I also advise that after a third reading, if you're not too conversant, the understanding is not proper. Then I will recommend that you do a fourth reading. So I put the two together, third or fourth. Now, but under this case, under this circumstance, I expect you to take your pencil, right? Whilst you are doing the third or the fourth reading, take your pencil and underline certain portions, sentences, phrases, right? That give a clue to the answer that you are expected to provide, okay? So for instance, if you read through the question and you are expected to answer questions on, say, sources of business finance. But in the course of reading through the case, let's say in the third paragraph, you realize that the case mentioned sources of business finance. Maybe you went ahead and mentioned about two or three sources of business finance. So it gives a clue to you that it could be a possible answer to the question you were asked. Okay, so you underlined that. Take note of that. Underline portions of the case where possible answers are likely to be located. They give a clue to the kind of answer you are supposed to provide. Take note of that. Very important. Let's move on. Now, now you have then a third or your fourth reading, so it is now you are, you are now conversant with the case, all right? The passage, you understand what the case is about. The problems that are presented in the case, you have an appreciation of that. So you have to pick your questions one after the other and you answer, right? Now, let's say question one. You are asked to, let's say, mention three sources of business finance available to a particular business, all right? So, you read the question. Now, go back to the case, all right, where you might have underlined the clues, all right, the source of business finance as indicated in the case. So go back to that and refer to it so that it gives you a better understanding of what exactly you are supposed to give as an answer to the question, all right? So always refer to the case. If not, you will be writing out of context. And don't forget that at the beginning I told you that case study questions should be answered based on the context. So because of forgetfulness, always consult the case. Under the circumstance of answering questions on case study, let your case be your Bible, your reference point, right? Don't rely on the ideas you already have. You will be getting it wrong. Now, in presenting your answers, as much as possible, use meaningful sentences, okay? Use meaningful sentences. And I look at a sentence as a group of words which make a complete meaning, right? I just will tell you a sentence has a subject and a predicate. In a sense, what, what it means is that a sentence should make sense. It should carry some sense, right? It should, it should make sense. When I read, I should make sense out of that. I should have an appreciation of that, what we have written. Because every sentence conveys a particular you know, message. So I should get to that. So make sure what you are writing makes sense to the examiner or the reader, OK? For example, three reasons for the manager's failure are outlined below, OK? So let's say in a particular case, you are asked to outline three reasons the manager failed in that particular business, right? So you, you give that preamble, then you go ahead, A, the manager was very lazy, all right? So let's look at that. The manager was very lazy. I mean, it makes sense. Everybody understands that. But if you go ahead and write, for instance, laziness, right? Laziness. What has laziness done here? Nobody understands laziness in this context, right? So we have to avoid that. Second one, I've written the manager was selfish. Okay, the manager was selfish. Everybody understands that. He is self-centered. It's understood. The third one, the manager did not respect his, sup his superiors. A complete sentence. It makes sense. So that is how I expect you to present your answers in case study. Don't be lazy and write short you know, sentences, 
no, not short sentence per se, but a, a phrase or a word and claim that that is good. For instance, writing laziness. Instead of writing the manager was lazy, you write laziness. What has laziness you know, got to do in this case? So you'll be getting it wrong, all right? So let's take note of that. Let's write complete sentences as much as possible. Now, I want us to take note of these important points if we are to do well in our case study questions. Now, the first point is that do not be in a rush, all right? So calm down. I mean, relax. Don't rush. Because you are supposed to work within a particular frame of time or time frame. Take your time. I mean, the questions are structured in such a way that reasonably you can finish you know, answering all the four questions within the time given to you. So there is no need to rush. It doesn't also mean that you should you know, relax so much. No. I mean, read, write at a reasonable speed. All right? Now, once again, do not spend too much time on the case study. Somebody wants to do a very, very close reading, so spend so much time on the case study. And, I mean, time, of course, is the most expensive resource in the world, right? Time spent is never recovered. So if you spend so much time, you realize that, you know, you don't have enough time at your disposal to answer the questions, even though you may have all the answers to the question. And don't forget, you would have, you know, three other questions to answer making it four questions you know, to get your 80 and above marks to get your A for us. Now, once again, as much as possible, use meaningful sentences. I think I have already said that. So as much as possible, use meaningful sentences. Sentences which make meaning, especially to the examiner, all right? Don't think that it makes meaning to you only, because you are not going to mark the paper. It's the examiner that is going to mark. Don't give room for the examiner to pocket some of your marks, right? To keep some of your marks in his or her pocket, right? So make sure that you are presenting the, the best answers to warrant the highest marks that are located to those questions you are answering. Another important point I have to emphasize is do not import facts. Very important. Stay with the facts as provided in the case. So in the case, I think generally we all know that, probably apart from the mathematics of marriage where one plus one is equal to one, ordinarily we all know that one plus one is equal to two, right? But in the case if you are told that one plus one is equal to 100, please go ahead and write 100 and get your marks, right? So you don't come there with your preconceived idea that one plus one is equal to one when you're looking at mathematics of marriage, or generally speaking, where we see one plus one to be equal to two. So forget about that. Stay to the facts. Don't bring facts from your pocket. Okay? Stay with the fact as presented to you in the case. This one is very important to me, my dear student. So let's take note of that. If you know that, tell your, your colleagues, all right, or friends. These are very important facts if they want to do well. Now, the next point I want to take note of is that as much as possible, use your own words in presenting the answers. All right? Don't quote verbatim. Hmm? Don't quote a particular sentence, a particular phrase in the you know, case. Then you go and quote the whole thing, present it as your answer. It may not score. You may not get you know, the, 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 the marks that you require to push you to get your grade A. So please, as much as possible, use your own words. Reframe the sentence. You see, I didn't say avoid using that or avoid doing that because in some circumstances it may be practically impossible, right? Or the question specifically may even require that you quote, right? So under that, that circumstance, you have no option, right? But apart from that, as much as possible, reframe the sentence without sacrificing the meaning, okay? You can reframe, change some of the words, right? You know, we have words and meanings and all of that. You can change some of the, of the words without sacrificing the meaning of that particular sentence. Now, the next point is that as much as possible, avoid quoting verbatim. I think I even mentioned that in explaining the point I just explained. So avoid that as much as possible, as much as possible. Stay away from that. Now, 
in the course of presenting your answers, always refer to the case before you write your final answer. Okay? So a particular case, you are asked to identify the type or the form of business. What you are expected to do is that, once again, go back to the case and see. Do you have some point clues in the case that point to the fact that that particular business is a company? Right? Do you have clues to the fact that that you know, form of business is a cooperative society? Any indication that it is a sole proprietorship? So go back, all right, and be sure. OK? Yes, because if it's, it's a company, there, are, there will be certain signals, certain clues. All right? Even the name, the name of the case. Let's open the back company limited. That alone suggests. So go back to the case and check. Is it there? Or it's just a name. Don't also be just deceived by the name because names are just chosen, right? I mean, going at the days where you hear somebody is called a German and you conclude that that person is, 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 is an Ashanti. Somebody is Koku, that person is an Ashanti. Somebody is Kobla, the person is an Eve. No, I mean, these things are changing, right? So don't just be deceived by just a name. So get a clue from the case so that your answer will be convincing, right? Now, another very important point, provide brief answers. I mean, don't write an essay, OK? Be as brief as possible. Present your answers briefly, all right? Without sacrificing the meaning. I mean, you don't have to write two, three lines before you can convey your meaning, right? I mean, be brief as much as possible. And once again, use simple sentences. Don't use compound, complex sentences, simple sentences. My name is Steven Essa Ajiman. Full stop. Simple sentence. I come from Gen C. Full stop. Simple sentence. All right? So as much as possible, use simple sentences. Don't use complex sentences to confuse yourself. The more complex sentences you write, compound sentences you write, you know, the more mistakes you make. So let's take note of that. Another important point I want you to understand, avoid generalization. Mm -hmm. Generalization. If, for instance, in the case, you are told that a particular business, let's say Ubin Neba Company Limited, they used only one promotional strategy, right, in selling their products, in conveying the good news of the quality product they have to their customers. Don't go and generalize that they didn't use any promotional strategy. Who told you that? You are generalizing. The case specifically mentions a particular one that they used. It may not be adequate. It may not have worked for them. But the fact is that they used a promotional strategy, even though it might have not worked for them. So don't generalize, OK? As it is stated that they didn't have enough capital. You don't go ahead and say lack of capital. I mean, without capital, how can the business you know, start in the first place? So you don't generalize that way. Stay to the facts given to you. So students, I expect you to take note of these points to guide you to be able to you know, write the best of answers to get the highest marks that I expect you to get. And you know, of course, that is grade A, right, in your subject. Now, we have looked at the way we are supposed to read, the way we are supposed to present our answers, and all of that. Now. We are going to look at some case, cases and we are going through them. Of course, we have a case and we have answers, so we shall go through them. We shall solve them. So at the end of the day, we are all conversant with what we are saying. So that it doesn't just become theoretical, but we know precisely how to solve the questions. So I start with sample case one, and that is Maybright's fashion. Right, so that is Maybright Fashion. That is the title of the case. So that is the name of the business. Like I told you, the case will always be presented with a business having some challenges, some problems, some issues, and you, right, with the knowledge in business, you are expected to solve those problems. Now, so let me read the case. So Maybright Fashion. Mary Ajiman is a young graduate from the University for Development Studies. After her national service with the Sunyani Metropolitan Assembly in the year 2015, 
She acquired a job as the assistant manageress in a renowned microfinance company in the Sunyani metropolis. To continue, after working for one year, she realized that a lot of people came to the microfinance company to save huge sums of money, even though such people were not involved in any formal work. Neither did such people have any higher educational backgrounds. According to her, these were people who were into small-scale businesses such as selling of cabbage, tomatoes, onion, and watermelon. She also discovered another category of customers who were always in high demand for personal loans to pay children's school fees, hospital bills, or to pay their fees in various higher places of learning. These were mostly employees of the government. Not enthused with this development, Mary tendered in her resignation letter to start her own business. She rented a small shop and started her fashion business since sewing was her hobby. Life became difficult for Mary because she had just started her new business and did not have many customers. There were times she sat in the shop for the whole day without a single person visiting her shop. She could only rely on a few friends she had made and some church members in her area. Her financial situation worsened in the first year in her new business. At a point, she contemplated going back to her former workplace to take up her position as the manageress. She did not have adequate funds to put her shop in a reasonable condition to attract the middle class into her shop. After struggling for two years, she got her breakthrough as she got financial support from one of her loyal customers to expand her business. After a fourth year in business, she breathed a sigh of relief and said, after all, I made the right decision to be an employer and not an employee. It hasn't been easy, but thank God for the bold decision. Okay? So this is the case. So I have done the first reading. I'm going to do the second reading and a third reading as I demonstrated. So I'll go back, start from the first paragraph and read through again with you so that you can have an appreciation of what the problem is. So we go through again. So Maybright Fashion, that's the title of the case or the name of the business. Mary Ajaman is a young graduate from the University for Development Studies. After her national service with the Sunyani Metropolitan Assembly in the year 2015, she acquired a job as an assistant manager in a renowned microfinance company in the Sunyani Metropolis. After working for one year, she realized that a lot of people came to the microfinance company to save huge sums of money, even though such people were not involved in the former sector. Neither did such people have any higher educational background. According to her, these were people who were into small-scale businesses, such as selling of cabbage, tomatoes, onion, and watermelon. She also discovered another category of customers who were always in high demand for personal loans to pay children's school fees, pay hospital bills, or to pay their fees in various places of learning. These were mostly employees of the government. 
Not enthused with this development, Mary tendered in her resignation letter to start her own business. She rented a small shop and started her fashion business since sewing was her hobby. Life became difficult for Mary because she had just started her new business and did not have many customers. There were times she sat in the shop for the whole day without a single person visiting her shop. She could only rely on few friends she had made and some church members in her area. Her financial situation worsened in the first year in her new business. At a point, she contemplated going back to her former workplace to take up her position as a manageress. She did not have adequate funds to put her shop in a reasonable condition to attract the middle class into her shop. After struggling for two years, she got her breakthrough as she got financial support from some of her loyal customers to expand her business. After the fourth year in business, she breathed a sigh of relief and said, after all, I made the right decision to be an employer and not an employee. It hasn't been easy, but thank God for the bold decision. So viewers, this is the second reading. As I indicated when I was talking about the, the strategies to adopt, to be able to understand your case and present the best of answers to warrant the best of marks. So I have to do a third reading. This time, I will be underlining portions of the case where answers to the questions are likely to be found. But of course, don't forget that I told you after doing the first reading, go and read the questions, all right? But I have done the second reading, but let me go back to the question and read all of them so that I have an idea what I will be expected to do in terms of the questions. So quickly, let me go to the questions and read through. So these are the questions. One or A, what was the major motivation for Mary's resignation from her job? What motivated her to resign from her job? B, or question two, identify any three sources of funds Maybright Fashion could have relied on for the expansion of her business. Question C, State three advantages associated with this form of business organization. The last question, state two things Maybright Fashion could have done better to improve upon her fortunes. So these are the questions. Four questions presented to us to deal with. So we go back to the case, do the final reading as we underline portions that you know, answers to our questions are likely to be found or located. So let's go back to the case. Now, Mary Ajman is a young graduate from the University for Development Studies. Now, before we continue, let's have a short break. We'll be right back. Hello, welcome back. So we're looking at the first case, that is Maybright Fashion. We've done the second reading and we've gone through the, the, the questions. So let's do the third reading where we underline, you know, portions of the case where possible answers are likely to be located, right? So let's start. So Mary Ajman is a young graduate from the University for Development Studies. 
After a national service with the Sunjana Metropolitan Assembly in the year 2015, she acquired a job as an assistant manager in a renowned microfinance company in the Sunyani metropolis. After working for one year, she realized that a lot of people came to the microfinance company to save huge sums of money, even though such people were not involved in any formal work. Neither did such people have any higher educational background. According to her, these were people who were into small-scale businesses, such as selling of cabbage, tomatoes, onion, and watermelon. She also discovered another category of customers who were always in high demand for personal loans to pay children's school fees, hospital bills, or to pay their fees in various higher places of learning. These were mostly employees of the government. Not enthused with this development, Mary tendered in her resignation letter to start her own business. She rented a small shop and started her fashion business since sewing was her hobby. Life became difficult for Mary because she had just started her new business and did not have many customers. There were times she sat in the shop for the whole day without a single person visiting her shop. So, for instance, sitting in the shop for a whole day, nobody coming there. You realize that there's a problem there. She could only rely on few friends she had made and some church members. That also presents an issue for consideration. Her financial situation worsened in the first year in her business. All right? So there is an issue there. Things are not going on well. At a point, she contemplated going back to her former workplace. So regretting even starting the business in the first place to take up her position as a manager. She did not have adequate funds. So inadequate funds present another issue worth considering. In a, so he didn't have enough funds to put her shop in a reasonable condition to attract the middle class into her shop. After struggling for two years, she got her breakthrough as she got financial support from some of her loyal customers. So she got financial support from some of her loyal customers. That also presents an issue. After a fourth year in business, she breathed a sigh of relief and said, after all, I made the right decision to be an employer and not an employee, all right? This whole quotation too also rings bell in our ears. It hasn't been easy, but thank God for the bold decision I took. So now, we are going to take the questions one after the other and we look at them. So the first question is, what was the major motivation for Mary's resignation from her job? Right? What was her major reason for resigning from the job? Now, let's go back to the case. Let's start. So the first paragraph, we are told he, she, Mary did her national service, you know, there's you know, metropolitan assembly and all of that. There is nothing of that sort mentioned. We move to the next paragraph. After working for one year, she realized, back, and all of that. So she realized that, uh -huh. After working for one year, she realized that a lot of people came to the microfinance company to save huge sums of money. All right? Something you need to consider. Those people were not involved in any formal work, or they were not working in the formal sector. All right? Let's continue. Neither did such people have higher educational backgrounds. They hadn't finished universities and all of that. They didn't have PhDs and what have you. We move to the second one. According to her, these were people who were into small-scale businesses. We move to the next, uh, the next paragraph. There was a mention of another category of people, right? Let's move to the next paragraph. Not enthused with the development, with this development. So what development is he talking about? So we are talking about a development where she sees that there are two categories of people. 
One, working in the former sector, they are always on them for loans. That is, they are coming to the microfinance company for loans. And there is another group that is not in the former sector, but they are always coming to save money with a microfinance company. So this is where we are likely to get our answers from. It's a reason we are told that Mary tendered in her resignation letter. Mary tendered in her resignation letter. So the answer revolves around this place. Okay? So you realize that something is happening, you know, in the mind of Mary. She realizes, no, there is something she's not doing right. All right? If she wants to realize her dreams in life, if she wants to do that, then something should be done. So let's go ahead and look at the solution offered to this question. So we look at the suggested answer to the question. Now, so we say that first, her major motivation was the fact that people who did their own businesses were better financially than government employees. All right? You realize that, I said, don't quote verbatim. You will not find this thing right state, rightly stated in the case. But we have framed it, as I was explaining early on. Okay? She sees two groups of people. One coming to the financial institution to take loans. Others are coming to deposit money. And she feels that she should join the other group that comes to deposit money. And not the other group that comes to collect loans. To pay higher interest. 20%, 30%, 25%, 18% and what have you. Okay? So she comes to that realization. For that matter, she turned us in her resignation letter. The other suggested answer, of course, you are supposed to give one, but there's another suggested one, which is her major motivation was that it was more rewarding doing one's own business than working for someone, especially government. Right? So per this case, you know, when starting school from class one, moving to primary JHS university, all we know is that, oh, we finish school and we get job in the former sector especially in, 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 the, in, in the state. The state should be our employer. The state should employ us as teachers, as nurses, as doctors, as engineers, and what have you. We hardly think of venturing our own businesses or establish our own businesses. That is a realization Mary comes to. Let's move on to the second question. That is question B which is identify any three sources of funds Maybright Fashion could have relied on for the expansion of her business, right? So when you go back to the case, you realize that we were told, let me get to that portion for you, that she didn't have enough funds to put her shop in a reasonable state or condition to attract the middle class, right? Let me look for that. Yes, so we are told that, I think that should be, I think, paragraph three or so. Let me start. I don't want to read the whole sentence. She did not have an adequate, she did not have adequate funds to pull her shop, right? So she's in business. She started business as, as an entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur, fresh from school, when you have national service. So she gathered some experiences, right? And she wants to bring that to bear by establishing her own business. But of course, a major problem has been capital, inadequate capital. So where can she fall under the circumstance? Once again, don't think about some strange, strange, unrealistic, you know, sources. Stay to the facts as presented to you. Don't import facts. Of course, we know we have short-term source of finance, medium-term, and long-term. We have internal source of finance. We have external and all of that, okay? But to look at the case and the one that is applicable here, the one that is practical, is applicable in this case, solving this problem. Okay, so what do you think, if I should ask you? Let's look at the suggested answer for question B or question two. Now, Mary could have relied on the following sources of funds. The first one is loan from financial institutions, all right? So maybe she could have even gone back to her former place of work to negotiate for loan, okay, to support 
you know, her business. The two, loan from friends and the relatives. That one is realistic. You call a friend, you call your relative to help you. You tell a person, oh, I have this plan, this is a business I'm doing, and I need some you know, amount of money to be injected into the business to make it big. The person will be willing to help you, being a friend or relative. Then the next one, trade credits, okay? We also look at trade credits as one of the sources of business finance, and this one is also feasible. It's realistic under Maybright situation, okay? Because, for instance, if you're into sewing, you may have to get some materials. And you can speak to somebody who sells you know, a variety of materials once you are honest, okay? And let me tell you this. Uh, when I was a student, I once attended a conference, and the facilitator told us that three things are important in business. Let me share this with you. He mentions, and I quote, three things are important in business. The first one is honesty, the second one is honesty, and the third one is honesty. In a sense, the facilitator made us understand that one thing that is key for business to thrive or do well is honesty. So if you want to rely on trade credit as a source of business finance, as a business person, then you must be trustworthy. When you collect, but I'm going to become a, de a debtor, you have to pay. Okay, so you must, you must be somebody who, you know, regularly or timeously pays his or her debt. So Mary could have fallen on any of these sources of business finance. All right? Good. Let's move on to the third question. And that is, take three advantages associated with this form of business organization. So once again, we go back to the case and see if there's any clue that tells us the kind or the form of business that Mary had ventured into, right? So from, from the beginning, we are told of Mary, all right, working in, a, in an institution, a microfinance company. Yeah, she realizes something. She meets two categories of people. Then she realizes that, no, something is missing. She has to do something about her, her life. So she resigns, and she establishes I want to see that Mary tendered in her resignation letter to start her own business, okay, to start her own business. Now, she rented a small shop and started her fashion business since sewing was her hobby. In fact, in the case, we are not told anywhere, right, anywhere that he even, you know, managed the place with two or three other people. There is nothing like that in the case. So that should ring some bells, right, in your mind, on your mind, that this is one person doing business all alone in terms of management, okay? So in this case, the person is in sole proprietorship. I hope you remember these things. Form one, forms of business organization. Sole proprietorship, corporate society, partnership, companies, and all of that. You must, you must know them. They are very important. Good. So we are asked to give three characteristics of this form of business. Of course, in a question, we are not asked to identify, but you must have that at the back, at the back of your mind. If not, then you are likely to get the question wrong. So let's proceed to look at the suggested answers to the question. Now, so... Oh, of course, we are talking about advantages. Sorry, we are talking about advantages associated with, with sole proprietorship. Good. Advantages, not features or characteristics. So one, we say that the advantages associated with the form of business of Maybright fashion are stated, right? The advantages are stated below. So look at the way it's been presented. They are stated below. So we itemize the one. Mary will enjoy profit all alone. Because it's a sole proprietorship, she manages the business all alone. Of course, she can get two, three, four, five, ten, twenty, thirty people to, you know, come and help as employees. It doesn't mean that it is not a sole proprietorship, right? But in terms of management and ownership, it is on her only. So if there is profit, it is hers. If there are losses too, the same way, they go to her. So let's take note of that. So since it's an advantage, we look at, you know, profit and not losses. If there are losses, then that would be a disadvantage. 
Okay. Now, the second point is that decision making will be easy for Mary. One person, of course, I, I must admit there is a, what is called intra conflict, conflict within you. You yourself sometimes you are at a loss. But many a time, if you want to take a decision in solitude that is all alone, it is simple, easier. You don't need to consult anybody. There is no democracy there where you have to consult this person. This person has to give an opinion, state their reason, their reason for saying this or that. No, all of these things are eliminated. So decision making is, is, is faster, right, and easier compared to other, you know, forms of business organizations like partnership. You were about 19 or 18. Everybody has to express his or her views on the subject matter. And this will lead to delay in decision making. The next one we can talk about is Mary will have her personal interest in the business. Okay? And this one permits me to mention, you know, state-owned enterprises. Mostly, I think it, it, it's been something like a general attitude, though it is very, very, very bad among us as Ghanaians that anything that belongs to the state, I mean, we see that as belonging to nobody. Maybe the air, so we can, we can behave anyhow towards that particular establishment or business, right? But if it's your own business, then of course you know that you have that personal interest, okay? Because if your capital goes waste, then you can imagine what will happen to you. And under the circumstance where she had even resigned from her job and taken up a new business, you think that that personal you know, interest will not be there, it will be there, and it's going to be higher compared to where he, you know, she was even working. That is a microfinance company. Okay. Now, the fourth one is that this form of business is easy to form or establish. You don't need to go through any formal, you know, processes to register your business. Okay. But of course, let me emphasize that the business name, there is what you call Act 151. It is called Registration of Business Names Act. Act 151. If you are in business, a sole proprietorship, whatever, you are not using your own name. If you are using your own name, you don't need to register. But if you are not using your own name, let's say Obidin Eba Company Limited, that is not your name, right? You are using that as a name of a business. Obidin Eba Enterprise, Obidin Eba Ventures, what have you, that is not your name. So you need to register that under this act, okay? So that everybody knows that that company is unique to you. You know, that business, as you say, is unique to you. It's for you. But apart from that, you don't go through any formal registration process. So in business, simple to form, unlike companies. Partnership, you have to get a partnership deed prepared. Company, you must get your constitution drafted. Under the former act, Act 179, you have to get your regulations you know, drafted, which serves as a constitution to your company. So I mean, this one, you have to follow a formal process. So it's also, to some extent, it, it, it will go into time. It will take a lot of time to do that. But sole proprietorship is not like that. It's that simple, that easy to establish. Now, the fifth point is that the capital involved in establishing this form of business is relatively small. Of course, in the case, we are not told how much you know, Mary you know, invested in the business. OK? Yes, but she was in business. It could even be that she already had a sewing machine or she got that from a friend. Of course, we are told she rented a shop, right? So maybe 200 Ghana cities, 300, 400, 500 Ghana cities, she has started her own business, right? Sometimes I tell my student, if you meet somebody who is selling ice water, and you ask the person, what do you do? And the person tells you that I'm a business person, a businessman, a businesswoman. Is he right or wrong? <laughs> I think she's right, or he's right, right? Because she's in business, or he's in business. She's selling ice water. She's in business. She's providing a good or a service with the aim of making profit. So she's in business. So that is that. So these are advantages associated with this form of business establishment or organization.